seats. And my name is Mark, and if I have not met you, I'd love to meet you right after the service today. And I just want to say this from the get-go. If you are, uh, if you're an agnostic, if you're an atheist, if you're not sure what you believe, uh, we have a seat for you here at On Mission Church. That goes for you, our friends online as well. We love to have a dialogue with you and get to know you. I want to share with you uh, why I have the hope that I have uh, found in Jesus. Well, to, to frame the message today, as we turn into Joshua chapter 5, uh, I want to frame it this way with a question, a question for you. And this morning, I want you to just think about this question and think about this more in your heart. The question is, if tomorrow, and if you knew this, that tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time, our time, an asteroid was going to hit Earth and everyone was going to die, how would it change your plans for today and for tomorrow? What would change? Would you change anything? Maybe you're thinking, well, you would try to find some way to restore broken relationships. You would uh, maybe try to check off the, the bucket list, whatever that is for you. And there's an actress a few weeks ago. She was asked this question. Maybe some of you saw this interview. I can't remember her name. But an actress. And she said, oh, if I just knew, if, like, tomorrow is the end, and if it's all over, like, I would just go, like, just to be fun to just push someone onto the subway tracks because I could. I'm like, Really? Out of all the things to do, that's the first thing that comes to your mind. Because you can. You can get away with it, right? In her mind. Well, maybe for you, you would try to do some spiritual things. Things of significance. And this morning, we cuddled as a family bed. We tried to walk through the passage for today. I have three little girls, Estrogen Empire. You guys know this. And we're cuddling, and we're talking this morning, and our oldest, she looked at... Um, I was talking about something. I mentioned that. I asked her the question... And she said, well, Dad, if that was going to happen tomorrow, I mean, really, if that's going to happen tomorrow, she's like, Dad, you know what I would do? She's like, I would just want to talk to Jesus even more before I go to be with him. One of those moments as a dad, you're like, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do too. That's what we should all hope for. That's where our hearts go as parents, right? So what would you do? I really want to be a church that if we answer this collectively, it would be so amazing if we'd say we wouldn't change anything if we're so active in evangelism and reaching the world for Jesus, if we're so into that, we're so into talking to him and reading his word that if we knew an asteroid was going to hit tomorrow at six, don't be freaked out by the way, this is not something that's true. But if that were to happen, you'd be like, no, I wouldn't change anything. Because you live your life with zero arrogance that tomorrow is guaranteed. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Everyone in this room knows of a loved one who has passed away. And I have talked with so many of you in the last couple of weeks. There's so much tragedy in our own church with connections of people you know. And what kind of arrogance does it take to think that tomorrow is guaranteed? It's not. We don't know. We can't play the game of trying to know. Well, friends, I really want to be a church that wouldn't change anything in how we live. I just want to be unstoppable, an unstoppable force. But friends, for whatever reason, these people that make these lists of pushing someone onto the subway tracks or doing whatever other dumb things that come to mind, why is it that for so many of us, so we would change a lot of things? We'd say, we do this, we just completely change the way we live. If we only had 24 hours plus, just, if that's it, we'd change everything. Well, why do we just not change now? Why is it so hard for me as a follower of Jesus to change? Why is the culture so attractive? Why are the ways of the world, the ways of the flesh, these desires we have, why is it so easy to gravitate towards those things and so hard to walk in the Spirit, the Spirit of God? It's because it's not natural to walk in the Spirit. It takes work. It takes focus. Well, friends... This morning, I want you to have this one thing in your minds as we leave here today. Because maybe for some of you, you feel like you really are stuck in the ways of the world. And you feel like in ways you are a slave to the flesh. Those things that you gravitate towards that, that grab you and connect you and they are magnetic and it consumes you. And yet you want to break that bondage. You want to be all in for Jesus. Well, friends, this is our one thing for you today is no person is free who is a slave to the flesh. No person 
is free, who is a slave to the flesh. And this morning, I was, as I was driving here, I was like, God, it'd be cool if no one showed up today. I'm going to be honest. It's one of those messages, one of those stories of the Bible. It is awkward. And just to be transparent, I'm going to be talking about male genitalia for the next 30 minutes. Um, but th- as we approach this, um, I'm thinking, well, this is, this is weird, but uh, we are a church that we are anything but politically correct. So if you came here to find a church that is politically correct, we are not going to be the best church for you. Uh, The Bible is anything but politically correct, and we aim to be a church that is biblically correct, which means we do not dodge around tough issues in the Bible, and we understand the, the inspiration, the inerrancy, and the authority that is in the Bible, and we don't dance around these subjects. And so we approach them head on. So I accept the challenge, God. (laughs) If you can imagine being in my shoes, maybe this week you read ahead in Joshua chapter 5. And I hope if you read it, it didn't just apply to your life. I hope when you read it, you said, oh, I'm going to pray for Mark right now. If you can imagine part of your career being standing in front of intelligent people in a room and being broadcasted around the world to talk about male genitals for 35 minutes, it's not easy. But as I read this this last week, I thought, okay, maybe some of you did pray for me because it's a difficult subject, but God has opened my eyes and what he means by this, the poetry, the crafting of his word, inspiring men to write what he wants us to know today. Well, we're in a series called Who Is Your Josh? And this is a series we're walking through, just not to cover the whole, we're going to cover the whole book of Joshua, but to give you a taste of the book of Joshua. And understand this is kind of an idea of mentorship as Moses is passing the baton to Joshua, the next one to lead the Israelites. And so he poured into Joshua and he invested into him. And now Joshua has the baton and he's carrying this weight, this load to lead one million, two million people he's in charge of as they're wandering in the wilderness. And now last week we talked about how we approach that finish line, the Jordan River, as that they knew their inheritance was there, this physical promise. And they cross the Jordan River now into their territory, rightfully theirs. But there's still some obstacles. Other people were occupying the land. Well, friends, in this series, I want you to think about who are you investing into. We talked about this in the first one many weeks back. If you are alive, you are a mentor. Whether you like it or not, someone is watching you like a hawk in everything you do in your life. And so we want to model our life, the life of Jesus, to the next generation and beyond for whoever that is for you. Because, friends, life is short. Life is very short. I mean, the reality, we don't like to talk about this, but the reality that tomorrow is not guaranteed and that someday your body will be in a box and people will gather and they, they will have potato salad and then they will start planning their next week. That is your life in a nutshell. It is fragile. It's like a mist of vapor. It's gone quick. So, friends, make sure you are passing on what you know about Jesus, your relationship with him to anyone and everyone around you. Well, friends, the setup for this is, again, the Israelites have crossed the river. And the supernatural power of God, he paused the Jordan River, and as the people cross, they're now into this promised land. But before they go into this battle, the conquest, okay, we're ready, let's get the machetes are sharp, the sledgehammers are ready to conquer Jericho. God says, no, wait, let's do something first. First, remember who I am and what I've done. Last week we talked about the stones. He had a leader from all the 12 tribes get a stone and make this memorial. And there's two different memorials so that the next generation of Israelites, the grandkids, grandkids, grandkids passing all the way down. As they pass this, they would see and say, Dad, what's up with those giant stones? And if there's drought and the river is low and they walk by and times are tough, They'd look at the mound of 12 stones. They'd say, oh, yes, that's right. God provides. Nothing to worry about because God provides. We covered that last week in chapter 4. And friends, now is the time for the Israelites to conquer. This is the time to seize the day and to go forward. They've crossed the river. We're going to hear some context now in chapter 5. And yes, things will get a little PG, maybe 13, but you can handle it today. The kids are in their own little wing, and they're doing their own thing today. But let's dive into chapter 5. We're not going to cover the whole chapter because it changes subjects. We'll cover um, the later part of the the chapter next week. 
as we also look at chapter 6. But friends, look at this in verse 1 of chapter 5 of the book of Joshua. It says this in verse 1. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted. I'm not sure what kind of visual you get, but I love this. Their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. So remember back with Rahab, the prostitute. Remember God working through bad lineages of the things we've gone through. He still can use you and your issues and your past. No matter the stains you have, he can still use you. Well, she had told these spies that came in that people were talking about the Israelites. They knew that they were approaching. They had heard the stories of the Red Sea parting. and These, these people are out wandering somewhere. And someday they might come to their inheritance. So fear was in these other kingdoms. These people knew that they were getting close. So their hearts melted in fear that they're getting close because the God, the God, and his people were getting very close to their camps. So now while they're afraid, as, as you read this and as I read this now, this is a perfect time in their fear to go forward. Israel, let's go. People are freaked out. We're pumped up, cross the river. Now is the time to seize the day. And then we look at verse 2. Oh, how God works. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives. Let's pause it there. Make flint knives. Now think about Joshua. I mean, really, think about this. He's hearing from God. Okay, he's ready. He's getting, he's obedient. Remember back in chapter 1, it talks about, okay, if you are obedient, obeying the commands of God, listen to God. So Joshua, in his obedience, he's like, okay, God, what's next? We are ready. I got the 40,000 guys right here. We got all the weapons. We've been doing push-ups for like 40 years. We're ready for this moment. And then God's like, okay, make flint knives. Flint. He's like, flint knives. Okay, are we going to like, Scratch these people because we want to, like, destroy them. Make flint knives and let the fun begin. Circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gilbeth, Haraloth, and he obeyed. So he went forward. Now, we don't have other words. We're not going to add words to Scripture. Don't worry. We're not one of those churches. I just want to see a video of Joshua's face out of his list of top 30 things that are preparing his teams for battle. This would not make the list. Let's line up all the guys and circumcise them. Circumcise them. Joshua, the call to leadership sometimes brings us to do things that are just very weird and difficult and awkward, right? For those who you serve. So circumcised. I have a lot to say about this. Number one is, ouch. <laughs> Guys, ouch. And if you don't know what circumcision is, I'm not going to explain it. You notice I don't have any visual aids today. I don't even know where to go with this. I'm trying to be as safe as I can. But ouch. Guys, we're thankful. If that. Uh, yes, anyhow, if you're a baby and you don't, I don't know. Anyhow, is it warm in here? It just feels warm today. I don't know. Is it just me? It just feels warm in here. <laughs> Ouch, number one. But I mean, Joshua's thinking again, flint knives this is so weird. Why am I doing this? Now, here's the thing. Flint, obsidian, a lot of you know if you've played with obsidian rocks before. The thing is, many scholars think that when you crack open the obsidian and get that sharp edge, the inside of that obsidian is one of the most sterile, clean things they could have had back then. And this is in the Bronze Age. So they had metal. They had ways to slice and cut things in different ways. And he says, obsidian, use obsidian. So it was sterile. It was clean. And friends, again, if you don't know what circumcision is, just everyone has an uncle in Alabama. Just ask him. He would love to explain this. Don't Google it. I want to save your lunch today, my friends. But here he is lining them up in obedience, in obedience. Some of us have a difficulty obeying scripture for the most basic things of life. And Joshua, what a model to us, lining them up. And yes, this area they're in, it's called the Hill of the Foreskins. Any other title might have fits, but it's literally called the Hill of the Foreskins. Well, a little backstory on circumcision. Since we're going there today, 
Love my career today. This was a powerful commandment from God in Genesis 17 of consecration to the Israelites, to set them apart from other nations. So little boys have this done usually eight days in. They'd have this done. I met with a man this last week, a neighbor sitting in his house, and he's Jewish, and we're talking about Jesus and different things for beliefs and sitting in his living room, and um, he told me he's scarred forever because he went to a circumcision. When he was an adult, he went, and there was a boy screaming, and all these things were happening. People were clapping and cheering, and it scarred him for life. So I kind of invited him today. I don't know if you're here, buddy, but I knew he maybe wouldn't want to come today because it's hard to avoid this again because we're in the deep end. But this is a covenant that God made with Abraham to require this, to set them apart as different. But this now, friends, back to Israel in this time, this is their moment to seize the day. So they could have adopted all these military plans and the stones are there for the, the memory and the memorial and it's time to go. And here he is using obsidian to circumcise the guys. I'll let you have whatever comes to mind for that. Well, why did he do this? Often we read scripture, we're like, God, what is the point of this? Well, why? Well, let's let scripture answer for scripture. It literally tells us. Verse 4, I have no, do no study for this. Verse 4, now this is why he did so. Thank you. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness. Again, this is 40, 40 years of wandering. They died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt, they had not been circumcised. Verse 6 says, The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they had left Egypt have died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us, of a land flowing with milk and with honey. Maybe to us it's not a big deal. Maybe you've warmed up milk and you've put honey in its grates. I know in 2022, you'd be like, well, is it dairy-free? Were they cage-free bees? We'd have all these different things. We'd ask God, what's in the promised land? Can I eat it? But back then, to have this was a big deal. And there's other, I just give different imagery to them. Verse 7, so he raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. Well, friends, there's something here in the symbolism about the flesh. The flesh. There's something about the power of setting Israel aside from other nations through circumcision. So these guys, it's said again, but they've actually, the ones who are now of fighting age had never been circumcised. So it was the first time for them. Now you're thinking, if any of you have any police experience or military experience, or uh, if you've played football, you kind of know like when to seize those moments of when it's time to go. The go moment where you attack, you go for it, you tackle well, this is the moment, but now the military is rendered useless. They're incapacitated. They're out for a season. They're out for a season. Well, friends, I want you to also understand this. In the culture they were in, as they're wandering, the Canaanites had all this land, not just the land, but they also had philosophies that were creeping into the Israelites' camp. Now, as I read this, I want you to think what culture comes to mind. Three things that were on the top of the list for this culture. But what culture comes to your mind when you hear this? They worshipped materialism. Number one, materialism. Number two, sensuality. The body, feelings. Number three, idolatry. Materialism, sensuality, and idolatry. Maybe some of you are thinking, that sounds like the United States of America. The Canaanites were in the same branch. And so they were worshiping these things. And some of that was bleeding into the Israelites. They struggled with idolatry, sensuality, and also with materialism. They had the same stuff that they were dealing with. But also, I see this today. Not much has changed in our culture, right? It's probably the same for you. Materialism, things. We all want stuff sensuality, how we feel, the body, sexual things as sexual creatures. And then also idolatry. Oh, man, I wish I could have that old. I'd check that out. Well, that's amazing. Seeing these things, maybe on social media, that pull our attention all the time. Canaanites had it way back then as well. So he wanted the Israelites to be set apart from the Canaanites. To set apart, to say, okay, we are going to deny 
the flesh. We're going to be different and not just go after the things that we feel, targeting the, the male organ that helps with reproduction as the focal points, targeting that, saying, okay, now this is going to be a symbol that we are set apart as God's chosen people. So now, to remove them from the bondage to this false belief system, he has them circumcised. And friends, I want to remind you, no person is free who is a slave to the flesh. If you are repeating things of the flesh, you are a slave to that thing. It has mastered you. New Testament is so clear, we're not to be mastered by anything, but the Holy Spirit is supposed to have power over us. Verse 7 I'm going to have to roll. Verse 7 says this. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. It's kind of repeating himself. Verse 8. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, wow, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Friends, this is like suicide from a military perspective. Okay, the enemy is scared of you. You're on their territory. This is a chance to go. And now it's like, okay, we're going to be out for a season. Healing. Not able to even defend ourselves. We don't even even want to walk around. You don't even want to do anything recovering from this procedure. Because as I read this, I'm thinking, why? And I, I can answer my own question. Because God's ways don't often line up with our ways. We have our systems, our strategies, our agendas that we usually lean into. And I know this in church leadership as well. And then all of a sudden God's like, whoosh. New plans. What about his ways? So God, helping them pause to think about him, to get themselves right first before they go in to try to conquer the land. Well, there's something more powerful going on here that as I was reading through the the scriptures this week that ties into the New Testament, other places in the Old Testament as well. As we're thinking about circumcision, mentioned in Deuteronomy and Jeremiah, the book of Romans and other places, it talks about the power of being circumcised in the heart. So us today, we need to be circumcised in our heart, not physically, this is symbolic language, that we are to deny ourselves of the flesh. We're to have that to be warned that we are different. We should be set apart as followers of Jesus, pursuing holiness of a holy God. We should be very different than the world. The world should look at you and they should look at me and say, what is, they, what, what is going on with that person? They are different. Why are they different? There's a glow about them. What is it? We should be different than the world. So Paul makes this clear. Other authors make this clear as well. So this would be an indication again. The heart for them physically with the the male anatomy would be an indication that they are set apart. Well, friends, 12 and a half years ago, I made a covenant in front of 350 people in my parents' backyard in Oregon with this beautiful French woman. And all I remember is lipstick on that day, and that's it. Everybody kind of blacked out, which most of us guys, we don't do well on our wedding day. We're just not born for that kind of stuff. And I remember as we had this ceremony, and, and a few days before, I had put this on my finger. And this will not fall off because it's on there forever. Because the more I study this, the more I want to, I want to model this with, with my wife. And so I have this as a symbol of my commitment to Mill. Now the thing is, we think about circumcision of the heart versus other, the anatomy and other places. The idea here is that I could have a ring and not be committed to my wife. I could be unfaithful to her. I could not have a ring and I could be very committed and faithful to my wife. The idea is just symbolism. So again, Jesus is challenging us. This is an inward motion that should be going on in your life that you are different. It should be a vow, a sign to him that you love him and that you are all in for him. So now, immaterial, invisible, if it is the heart. Well, let's look at verse 9. It says this, Then the Lord said to Joshua, I'm sure Joshua is just freaked out, now by God. He says this, Today I have rolled away the reproach Some versions say the shame. Maybe you have that in your version if you're looking at a different version. Today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. I've rolled it away from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Now Gilgal means a place of memorial, a place to remember. 
Like those stones, you set this up. Maybe you've heard of different ministries called Gilgal. Churches called that. It means a place to remember, a place of memorial. But this is so interesting when I read this. So he's taken them way back when they were in bondage, going all the way back to Egypt when they had this title that they were slaves. They were brick makers. They were forced to do horrible labor and other things. They were there. They're in captive. They were captivity there in Egypt. But he says, today I've rolled away the reproach. So he's saying, I'm now rolling away the shame of the title you had of being a slave. So you don't have that banner anymore. You don't have that title. You're out there wandering because of disobedience, idolatry, and not listening. Forty years of trying to figure this out. But he says, now I want to erase that from you. You are no longer a slave. That title's gone. That shame is gone from you people. God's making this official now in front of them. That's no longer part of you whatsoever. So now they had this, this, you could say, like permission for a new lens of how to view themselves. Because it's tough when you go through stuff like that and try to figure, okay, this is is now my banner. Sometimes we've been, things have been horrible that have happened to us and we wear that as a banner. But he's given them license to now be free from that title of being slaves. So now, because of the radical trust and their obedience to God, God has given them new hope, new titles, new perspective. And I want to remind you, no person is free who is a slave to the flesh. And so now, through this action of circumcision, now, new title, this freedom is starting to reign. As they now are entering the promised land, all of a sudden they're starting to see these things they've dreamed about for 40 years. Well, let's look at verse 11. It says, the day after the Passover, the very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Verse 12, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Finally, after wandering for so long, getting manna, it's the same thing. Yes, God, you provide, but it would be nice to have a little bit of a buffet. Just, can we change this up a little bit? Finally, they get into this land. They're starting to partake in the inheritance that was given to them, partaking in the food. Maybe milk and honey were involved in that as well, but they can enjoy the blessings of God as they rest in his promises, what he said he'd provide. So here he is, and here they are, together as one, as Israelites and God, as they now partake in the blessings that God had poured poured out for them. Well, friends, as we focus on this, that no person is free who is a slave to the flesh. And I don't know all of your stories. I'd love to hear your story if I haven't heard your story before. But one of the best, the best, I should say, marathoner of our time, Eliud Kipchoge. Some of you have probably heard of him. Years ago in Vienna, he was the first one to run sub two hours for the marathon. Yes, it was more of a scientific experiment than an athletic achievement, but we'll just ignore all the lasers and pacers and the springs and the shoes. I would say, yeah, it's amazing. But he is one of the most disciplined people you'll ever hear of. As he has this quote that lines up with this, that he, he famously has said, only the disciplined in life are free. If you are disciplined, you are not a slave to your moods and your passions. This means when we wake up as Jesus people, we don't just say, we're just going to let the day take us and just go with our feelings. It doesn't mean on a Sunday morning, I just don't feel like worshiping corporately with the body of Christ. I just don't feel it today. It means we get over that. It means if you're like small groups coming to study the word of God, be honest, I don't feel like doing that. It's had a weird week. It means you get over that. You fight for the spiritual disciplines because it takes discipline. And those who are disciplined are free. They are no longer slaves. Because, friends, when you live a life of being circumcised in your hearts, you're not a slave to the world anymore. And all the temptations we have through social media and other avenues, it's crazier than ever. I still say that our middle schoolers now, our high schoolers now, they have it so much more difficult than when I was in a middle school and high school. It was tough when I was in middle school and high school. But now, that was like pre social media, way pre social media. So a lot of you adults, you didn't have that either. But now with the temptations of comparison games, jealousy, it breeds depression, anxiety. We see the lift and the the rates of suicide are going through the roof and depression as well. They coincide often. And the world is screaming for our attention. 
Friends, let's ignore the world and live like Christ and be like him and follow him and say no to the culture. I want us as a church to be ones who will confuse people in our actions and how we respond in situations. Many of you have heard the story of Louis Zamperini, the Olympic runner, World War II survivor, who was tortured in Japan for, I think, two years and went through all this survival stuff before that. And when he got back to the States, he wasn't a Jesus follower, and he became an alcoholic. And I think he went to a Billy Graham revival, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he gave his life to Christ. And the first thing on his agenda, he said, I want to fly to Japan and meet these guys that torture me because I want to forgive them. That does not make sense in the world's eyes. That is walking in the Spirit. It's because he was free. He didn't have the chains. I've met people say, I'm going to sell everything and go into the mission field. Makes zero sense to the world. I've met so many people that hardly make anything. They want to give so much to different ministries. It doesn't make any sense to the world. In a world that says, you climb that corporate ladder, you get as much as you can. You compete with the numbers. Climb, 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 climb. That's where satisfaction lies. Then you get there, it's hollow and empty. Brings zero fulfillment. Well, friends, we should confuse the world in our actions. We should baffle them and how we respond. Well, friends, I want to read this to you. This is my, my wife read this. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. It's not on the screens. I just want to read this for you again because she read it, and I want to have this be our bookends in a way. But Paul reaffirms this. In the New Testament, he says this in Romans 6, 4 through 7. He says, when we were baptized into his death, speaking of Jesus, we were placed into the tomb with him. So when Jesus died, if you're a Jesus follower, that should also resemble your death to self. Your death to self. So I've been able to walk in the tomb they think they put him in. And walking in that, that was a very emotional experience. Think, if this is actually it. We should be dead to the world and dead to sin as well if we focus on that, if we follow Jesus. As Christ was brought back from death to life, by the glorious power of the Father, so we too should live a new life kind of life you should be born again a new creation it's like starting over if we've become united with him in a death like this certainly we will also be united with him when we come back to life as he did we know that the person we used to be was circ- was crucified with him and put an end to sin in our bodies because of this we are no longer slaves to sin No longer slaves to sin. The person who has died has been freed from sin. Friends, if you are dead because of what Christ did, it might be a little bit confusing, then there should be victory in his resurrection as you live in him, as you try to live with Christ and in Christ. So friends, the question for you is, if you knew that tomorrow you were going to die, what would you change? What would you change in your life? What thing of the flesh are you still bound to? You need to just cut the cord. What is it? Maybe for some of you, it's abstaining from things online that you're getting involved with that you know you should not get involved with. Because it's easy, it's secretive. No one knows, right? Some of you need to cut that cord and get away from that temptation. Friends, consecration precedes conquest. Consecration, the act of getting ourselves clean and rights before him, it precedes conquest. If you're trying to live in Christian victorious living and living with Christ, we have to consecrate ourselves first, getting ourselves ready, ridding ourselves of things of the world. Um, Before I get up here on Sundays, I make sure that I am right with him. Jesus, let me confess some garbage to you. I don't want to stand in front of you and be a hypocrite. I want to live this. I want to be be separate. I want to be um, set apart and as holy as I can before him, before I communicate this to you. That's what I try to do. And that's what he wants from us as well. Well, friends, maybe for some of you, you've never even placed your faith in Jesus 
Um, maybe you've never said yes to him. You're trying to fight these battles on your own in life, and you're trying to take life like a bull by the horns, but you just feel like you don't have the control, you don't have the power. It's because you don't have the power, you don't have the control. And so I'm going to say this bluntly, but this morning, if you've never placed your faith in Christ, you are lost. And the best way to be found is by finding a Savior. And so Jesus, for his love for you and his obedience to the Father, he, he, he obediently put himself on a cross. And he took the sins of the, of the world on his shoulders, and he died because he loves you. He paid that price. He paid that atonement for you because he loves you. And it didn't stop there. He didn't just die to make a way for forgiveness. He rose again. He, he's now alive. We worship a living God today. Church, do you believe that we worship a living God? A living God. I know around the globe today, there's so many people bowing to different idols that they've made. I'm like, how could you do this? You carve that. What are you doing? We worship a living God. Well, friends, if you've never placed your faith in Christ, we're going to have some prayer team members in the back of the room. We would love to pray with you. If you have prayer requests for anything else, we'd love to pray with you. I will be back there as well. Friends, as the band comes up this morning, we're going to do a thing called communion. And maybe for some of you who are not used to the church routine, that's okay. I'll try to explain this. But it's a time where we recognize Jesus' his last 24 hours of life on earth. He sat with his disciples, and they partook of the Lord's Supper. And he got out the bread. He got out the, the wine. He said, hey, this resembles my body that was broken for you. And the wine then, we have juice today, resembles his blood that was poured out for you. And so we do this the first Sunday of the month to help us remember what he's done for us. Last week we talked about stones, these 12 stones, because we need memorials. And here we have two execution devices to remind us of what he has done for us. But friends, before you take communion, I want you to consecrate yourself. You need to make sure you are right before him. If you are not a follower of Jesus, we ask that you just abstain from taking of the communion today. You want to make yourself right before him first. Well, friends, let me pray for us again. If you need prayer, we'll be in the back, room, uh, back of the room. And as far as how communion works, it's simple. You come up front and you'll take the elements and just go back to your seat on your own timing and just take the elements. Pray with your family if God leads you. Or whoever you came with, if you're by yourself, just pray between you and God. Friends, let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much, God, for this awkward story. But God, I love how you work in poetic ways. I love how you use this imagery, God, that we are to be circumcised in our hearts, that we should be different. This idea of saying no to the flesh, being different than the world. So Jesus, help this church body to say no to the world. And God, if you take us home tomorrow, because we are not citizens of this planet, we are not citizens of this dark, anxiety-filled place that gives us zero hope, and so be it. I'm excited to meet you face to face. But Jesus, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, God, Spirit, pull on them. Have them confess what they need to confess. Jesus, we thank you for paying the ultimate price for us. That way we can walk in victory with you. And Jesus, I pray this in your name. Amen.